Hello, everyone. My name is Helen Ho. I'm an assistant professor here at Cold Spring Harbor Labs. And my lab, which is just five minutes uphill from here, studies how the brain controls um, behavior, especially facial expression. So that's the topic that brings me and Isabella together tonight. So why facial expression? Why expression but of emotions? So when, um, when I went back to university, which was about 10 years ago for my master in ethology, I was really interested only on generally on animal behavior in general. I wasn't even spe specific about an animal. But when uh, I started to look at the expression of emotion and uh, I reread this book by Darwin, it was so... Um, connected to my work as an actress and all of a sudden these two things that I thought that were not related, my acting and my interest in animal came together and I wrote this uh, monologue for this reason. And you, what, what makes you interesting about the, the expression of your emotion in your mice? Yes. Yeah, so Yes, so my lab studies facial expression in mice. And um, yeah, so my lab specializes uh, in how the brain controls behavior okay, and how individual cells in your brain are connected together to give rise to everything you just dis discussed in your play, disgust, right, smile, etc. And um, because we're motivated, as your play has introduced so beautifully, that the face is this compelling, clear window into the mind. And by studying how the brain controls facial expression, we can really get at how the brain works. Yeah. And also probably uh, how animal communicates. Uh, you know, I always thought uh, as an actress when, when I read papers about certain um, noises that animal make, calls, and all that. That it was—it's interesting, but it was limiting mm -hmm. because I knew that uh, uh, as an actress, I, it's not uh, what I say, but how I say it. So if a dog goes bow, but w w moves the tail, it might mean the opposite if it doesn't move the tail. So I knew that I could manipulate, it and I was wondering if the animals can do that too. It took me a very long time to study science. One of the reasons was that when I was a little, I come from a family of artists. My mother was an actress. My father was a, a, a filmmaker. Grandparents were photographer and architect. So science for me was a very intimidating subject. Animal behavior seemed less intimidating once I read, uh, you know, Conrad Lawrence and Jane Goodall. And, um, but at the university, they were not offering animal behavior when I was 20. And um, so I just stayed in the family business. You, <laughs> and only after many, many, you know, when you're getting older, you just uh, are much more courageous. You just say, I have, I don't know if it's courage, you just say, if I don't do it now, I'm going to be dead and I haven't done it. So it isn't courage, it's that kind of a hurry that you have to do it. So I went back to university. But I was so amazed to come to your lab the other day and see you and young uh, women from all over the world. You are uh, from China, your assistants are from uh, Nepal and uh, Spain, and it was full of admiration of women doing science and also creating all these uh, cameras and incredible mechanism. And I thought you would need an engineer. I said no, no, we do it ourselves. How how did you come about it? Is there a difference in generation that I was so intimidated by science and you're, and you're not? Do you think that counts? Yeah, so women in science is such a topic dear to my heart. I, th I would like to think we have come a long way. I'd like to think we've made a lot of progress. Um, that is not to say there are no challenges as well. That's a, um, another longer conversation. But for me personally, uh, I fell in love uh, with science the first time I looked into a microscope at a slice of tomato. So just the cells are so beautiful, it captivated me. And fast forward to today, I still feel like 
as scientists, we have the luckiest job. I, every day we come in and we peek into the life secret, and they're beautiful. Right? It's as you have shown, evolution. It's this force that created such wisdom over time, a lot of time, and you know, there's created so many puzzles for us. And if within our lifetime we can just address a couple of them, and uh, we're be so content and it's just being in front of this vast wisdom and beauty um, that I feel so lucky. What is your goal? I mean, my goal uh, is not to become a scientist. I don't think I have, I'm 70, soon 71. I don't think I have the time uh, left. <laughs> But I thought that I could uh, um, translate what I read. It was so difficult at times because the language that scientists use sometimes is, in, I think, in the attempt to be very precise and it can be so um, difficult to understand. And it was to trying to make it easier and make it comical and uh, um, available because my of my experience in the show business. What is your ultimate goal with the, do you have one or not? Yeah, I think what wakes me up every morning is to, that work in my lab can contribute to how uh, knowledge of how the brain works in health and disease. Um, I'm motivated by the fact that lots of basic research motivated by curiosity of animal behavior, about um, how the brain works, will lead to fundamental principle understanding of biology that can um, uh, lead to cures of diseases. And my goal as a head of a lab is also to mentor uh, scientists. Many of folks in my lab are here today uh, just to inspire folks to enable their passion and their um, their career. And also, just like tonight, I, I think science has this amazing power to inspire. I hope everyone can be intrigued by the wonder of science that, you know, if you go home tonight, just think more about your dog, your cat, how they're behaving, and have that curiosity I think our our job well, is, is a big engine. If uh, mm -hmm. sometimes they ask me, you know, what what is the engine? What is it motivates you? Is curiosity, and I bet that is you too. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And I think our curiosity. You mentioned this as we're so happy to welcome you to visit our lab. I think some of the same questions that Darwin asked. Right, they're not a new questions, but we have the technology now to address those questions. You talk I mean, about just just the genes. I mean, he didn't even know that, okay. but he knows that it was a, a mechanism of heritage that could have passed on generation after generation, but he didn't know what was, what caused it. That's right. Uh, and the knowledge of genes led to these modern genetic molecular tools that let a lab target specific cells. And also camera, right? You talk about camera holding it for 60 seconds. Our mice are not going to hold it for 60 seconds, no. right? And you have yeah. a camera that can photograph so fast that their movement that are too fast for us to catch. Exactly. The camera can yeah. slow it down and you could see. I know, right. So we can see, capture hundreds of frames per second at high Generally, there are tw you need 24 frames to simulate um, movement, uh, mm -hmm. the way we perceive it, a yeah. hundred, wow. <laughs> yes, and then t we can use artificial intelligence to really learn how to detect these tiny changes on the mouse, of a face of a mouse, right, which is a hundred times smaller than ours. So with these tools, hopefully we're finally answering questions that Darwin dreamed of in a satisfying way. Can you imagine if you came to your lab and saw that camera that could take 100 frames per second and he had his uh, electrodes with Duchenne <laughs> and, and he would send this photo all over the world trying to see if people can detect uh, what were the expression. It, it's, 
it's a valid attempt, but it seems so primitive, but so valid on the other hand, isn't it? Absolutely, mm-hmm. absolutely. I would love to invite Darwin to visit. Me too. too. Yeah. I, I always uh, dream, maybe when we're dead, we can meet him. <laughs> I know, I know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I have another question for you. Um, many students come to me, uh, you know, we talk about in, in order to present uh, our findings to the public because we really want to, you know, uh, be able to showcase all the findings here at Cold Spring Harbor Lab. And a question is about public speaking. Um, do you ever have stage fright? So and we have always stage stress fright. I, we always have stage fright. I have it every night. Um, and uh, in the first few minutes, my heart pounds very, very fast. And then um, it slows down and concentrating and not getting... It's funny. Um, that is another thing we have to understand. Um, there is a memory in my movement. So... Um, if uh, if I sit there when I say that Darwin lived in the country and I show the pigeon, if I don't sit there and I wouldn't remember the words. If I change, you know, if I change my physical movement, so there is something in the physicality that helps me uh, remind uh, uh, what I say and the order of what I say. It takes also a lot of repetition. Um, and then as when I feel that the audience is listening, uh, this helps me uh, to relax. Uh, when I feel that the audience is not listening, you get more. You want to run away. <laughs> and so, public speaking is always very difficult. But we um, discussed it. One of the things that I do uh, when I do public speaking, or also as an actor, is to feel. Uh, who's paying attention and you pick two or three people you don't have to speak to a multitude of people just make sure that you feel a positive energy and somebody paying attention to you there and somebody paying attention so that you can talk to these two people but by moving the heads back and forth the the audience has the feeling you're talking to everybody but sometimes avoid talking to the one who's yawning, the one who's looking at the phone, because that will throw you completely. And this is empathy, is connecting. Helen and I did an exercise. I, uh, I, I'm going to, we're going to do it for you. It's an exercise that actors do all the time to try to connect. We don't have to go to dinner together, get to know each other, all that might help, but um, it's really connecting, really feeling that uh, human emotion are all the same, there's a common denominator to all of us. And so we pick up a word, we cap a sentence that has not very much meaning, and we repeat it. And in spite of repeating this, all of a sudden, emotion will come up. We just have to give it some time. So Helen and I are going to repeat the same sentence to one another for a little bit of time. And you will see at the beginning, you say, what are they doing? This is so boring. But then emotions and expression of emotion will bubble up. This is an exercise that we actors do to play. Like I said, with like playing tennis, hitting the ball back and forth. You wear glasses. I wear glasses. 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 Yes, you wear glasses. I wear glasses. 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 I wear. You wear glasses. I wear glasses. <laughs> you wear glasses. I wear glasses. 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 
glasses. You wear glasses. I wear glasses. You wear glasses. I wear glasses. And we see there is emotions. We are connecting. And this is what actors do. We have to connect. And connection is something we do all the time, even in public speaking. Um, and I know it's very frightening. And I am very frightened, especially tonight, because I'm sure that among of you there is a lot of scientists. And <laughs> so I hope uh, I've entertained you. And uh, with Helen, we are going to be busy watching mice <laughs> and their expression of emotions. And I, I was so touched uh, that Ellen and Dagna came to see my show and I did it in Long Island in the village where I lived, uh, Brookhaven and Bellport. Uh, it was such an honor to be here. Generally, we performed in the theater, but we squeezed everything in this auditorium, our set, to be with you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs>